fighting for the unborn. It's the 48th annual March for Life in the nation's capital. We have a report and reaction, including why the event looked a little different this year. And speaking out, how a well-known Catholic figure spent the day lending her voice for those in the womb. On EWTN News Nightly for Friday, January 29th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. While some pro-life leaders mark today's 48th annual March for Life in person, many who would have otherwise marched in D.C. joined in virtually, and that includes pro-life lawmakers who are continuing their work to promote the protection of the lives of the unborn. Correspondent Mark Irons starts our team coverage tonight. Mark? Tracy, today we heard from Republican as well as Democratic lawmakers, advocates and athletes. Everyone's trying to build up a culture of life. And though this year's March for Life looked different than previous years, the commitment to defending life continues on. Nearly a half century of marching for unborn children. Welcome to this virtual rally for the 48th annual March for Life. A different look and smaller crowd amid concerns about the coronavirus pandemic and security in Washington. Jeannie Mancini, the president of the March for Life, shared this year's theme, Together Strong, Life Unites. The march and our movement is made up of Americans from every racial and ethnic background, every walk of life, and every faith tradition. Today, pro-life leaders processed in Washington. It was preceded by a virtual rally. We always march on. Super Bowl champion Benjamin Watson and his wife Kirsten say building a culture of life isn't dependent on a large gathering. It begins in our homes, overflows to our places of worship and employment, and influences our local communities. And we must engage with humility, seeking God's wisdom and favor for the days ahead. And Politicians spoke, including Democrat Angie Hatton, the Kentucky House of Representatives Minority Whip. She believes a bipartisan effort to end abortion includes eliminating the reasons women seek abortion in the first place. When we don't support families struggling with affordable child care and preschool, when we don't adequately fund foster care and adoption services and social services, we drive up the number of women who feel that they have no choice but to seek an abortion. New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith called on President Biden to stand for vulnerable children in the womb. These children need the President of the United States to be their friend and advocate, not another powerful adversary. And we talked with Tennessee Republican Senator Marsha Blackburn. Today she introduced legislation to prevent taxpayer funds from going to abortion clinics. We believe that protecting life at all stages of life is important and this is one way we can protect the life and the health of women and their unborn children. Today's march ended right behind me, as it always does at the Supreme Court. And back to those Senate Republicans like Marsha Blackburn, they're continuing to put forth pro-life legislation. Just today, Senator Steve Daines of Montana announced he will introduce 13 pro-life bills this Congress, including two separate bills to prohibit sex-selective abortions and abortions of babies with Down syndrome. In Washington, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the March for Life presents a big contrast between presidential administrations. One year after President Donald Trump spoke at the event, it seems President Joe Biden didn't even acknowledge it. What House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. I've asked the White House press office a couple of times now for a comment about the March for Life. So far, no response. This as President Joe Biden continues to undo President Donald Trump's pro-life measures. President Joe Biden pays a visit to Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Earlier, Press Secretary Jen Psaki held a White House news conference. Neither person mentioned today's March for Life. It's a sharp contrast from last year when President Donald Trump became the first president to attend the rally. It is my profound honor to be the first president in history to attend the March for Life. On the same day, Vice President Mike Pence spoke to our crew in Rome, and White House advisors Kellyanne Conway and Joe Grogan joined our live coverage from the White House. This year, the opposite. On the eve of the March for Life, President Biden, a professed Catholic, signed an executive order to reverse the pro-life Mexico City policy. He's also seeking to change Title X, 
which the Trump administration revised to cut funding to abortion providers. Basically, the best way to describe them, to undo the damage Trump has done. Vice President Kamala Harris is also considered hostile to the pro-life movement. For example, demanding that states seeking to pass abortion laws first get federal review and approval through the Justice Department to make sure they're constitutional. Also, both she and President Joe Biden recently defended Roe v. Wade, saying, quote, the right to choose has been under relentless and extreme attack. She is um, for abortion on demand for any reason. At any point, she wants taxpayer funding for abortion. She wants to basically enshrine the abortion industry as a government-supported sector of our country, and that means hundreds of thousands of more deaths over time. Also tonight, the Hyde Amendment. That rule, you may know, prevents taxpayer dollars from paying for abortions in the U.S. through Medicaid. Now, President Joe Biden flip-flop on that issue. He is now against the Hyde Amendment. And tonight, the future of the Hyde Amendment remains uncertain. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, my next guest is well known for her pro-life witness, speaking out and standing up for the unborn. Sister Deidre Byrne of the Little Workers of the Sacred Hearts of Jesus and Mary joins me now on Skype. Sister, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on today. We're really so grateful. Um, as a longtime pro-life advocate, tell us your thoughts on the 48th year of the march. Um, well, we don't have hours to talk about this, but this is, I just feel um, we have to pray really hard. We have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, it's, it's shocking to hear the term good Catholic has unturned all that President Trump, who was the most pro-life president, and all the pro-life issues that he had done, this so-called good Catholic has undone it all. And that's not a Catholic movement to me. That's uh, anti-Catholic. Yeah, indeed. I, I know you described speaking out in defense of life and defending life really as your passion. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of supporting women and the unborn in this way? It's, it's, uh, it's part of our faith. We have to support um, everyone who's in, in distress, who's being uh, um, turned away or forgotten. And the child in the womb, whether it's a little boy or a little girl, or are the most unfor are the most forgotten. They're dehumanized. It's not just supporting women, but it's also supporting men because uh, it takes two to tangle. You've got a father and a mother, so they they also need to be um, cared for, both the father and the mother, as well as the child. Yeah, Sister Dee, you you touched on this. You know, with the new administration. Uh, seeing an attempt to reverse many of the pro-life gains th that we made. Uh, so much of today's political discussion from those who support abortion is framed around, quote, health care. Uh, as a medical doctor and, in fact, a surgeon, what goes through your mind when you hear that? And, and how is it undermining the sanctity of human life? First of all, life begins at the moment of conception. I learned that in medical school. And so... Um, we were trained as physicians to to support life. Abortion ends life. So preborn babies are at our mercy to defend their lives, and we need to be there for them. So we need to bring back the humanity, not only in each one of us, but in the little child that's in there. And there, I've met some real heroes there at, here in Planned Parenthood in Washington, D.C. They're doing such marvelous work trying to reach out to these young women giving them options other than abortion, supporting them financially, supporting them with uh, clothing for the babies, uh, helping them with shelter. The real heroes are there at the front line. For sure. Um, I want to ask you something that I've been asking pro-life leaders throughout the day today, and that is, what would be your advice to people who want to get involved in the fight for the unborn but really aren't sure how to begin? I think, um, first of all, pray. I've uh, spent a lot of time in prayer. I think this is how I sort of got involved with this in the beginning when I was in the chapel praying during the in August to um, be the, more of the voice for the unborn, and I think God had kind of catapulted me in that direction. Um, there's a lot of... It, find the local Planned Parenthood in the neighborhood and in your area, in your state, and find you'll find uh, pro-life warriors there. The 40 Days for Life is an excellent program. But if you go uh, some morning on a Saturday, or just go down to the Planned Parenthood, you're going to find heroes there who are uh, working and praying. And you, all you have to do is go, if you have a rosary, 
or you have a Bible, let's go out there, or you two have two hands, just go there and pray and um, beg our Lord and our Blessed Mother at St. Joseph to help change the hearts of all these people. And I've asked everyone to, to set their alarm clock for 3 p.m. That was a divine hour, the divine mercy hour. And let's pray for our president to change his heart to become more with a big C Catholic. Important. Uh Sister Didi, we probably have about a minute left, but I'm wondering, um, you have any final thoughts, anything that you can share with our viewers? Just don't lose hope. Uh, we are people of faith, and we've been through some tough times before. Again, as I said, I want to stress, please pray for all, our, all those in the administration. Um, but know that God's in charge. He's number one. We are just his foot soldiers, his arms, his heart, his hands. So just be your, the best you can. Be in the state of grace. Be as holy as you can be so that you can share that holiness with as many other people as you can. So pray, go to Mass, confession as often as you can um, for the Catholics and for those Christians. Just, just pray and be as pure as you can so that you can see as Christ has seen in the eyes of God. Oh, so, that. No, that's okay, <laughs> Sister Didi. Thank you so much. We really appreciate okay. it, and, and we appreciate you, and God bless you for what you do. Thank you for your time Thank today. Thank you very much. God bless you. Bye-bye. Uh, Pope Francis grants a plenary indulgence for anyone marching for life today. An indulgence is the remission of the temporal punishment due to sins which have already been forgiven. The Vatican announced this year's indulgence before the announcement that today's march would be virtual. Well, just this morning, the Holy Father tweeted about the importance of life. The Pope's tweet reads, quote, The culture of life is the heritage that Christians want to share with everyone. Every human life, unique and unrepeatable, is priceless. This must be courageous proclaimed ever anew through word and action. Coming up, as President Joe Biden makes abortion easier, we look at a new poll examining the attitude of Americans towards abortion access. Some Republican lawmakers in Kansas want to add a pro-life amendment to the state's constitution, and they want to put the measure on the ballot in next year's primary election. Now, if passed, it would overturn a 2019 Kansas Supreme Court decision that made access to abortion a fundamental right. Well, new polling finds a majority of Americans, including those who identify as so-called pro-choice, support significant restrictions on abortion. The survey, conducted by the Marist College Institute for Public Opinion and sponsored by the Knights of Columbus, indicates that three out of four Americans, or 76 percent, believe that significant restrictions, even beyond those presently existing, should be placed on abortion here in the United States. Joining me now on Skype is Tim Sakosha, Senior Policy Director for the Knights of Columbus. Tim, welcome. So good to have you on. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the latest polling indicates a great deal of consensus when it comes to Americans' opinions on abortion uh, across political parties and faith backgrounds, even among those who identify as so-called pro-choice, that is, um, that there needs to be restraint. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Well, sure, and thank you for having me. It is, and it's a consistent result that we found over the past decade of doing this poll with the Marist uh, Institute. Um, this year, like you said, we found 76 percent of Americans think that abortion should be limited to, at most, the first three months of pregnancy. And this includes a bipartisan majority, Republicans, Democrats, over 80 percent of independents, and like you said, pro-choice Americans as well. And so uh, this isn't a, a one-off uh, instance. This is a consistent result that we found, and we think that um, this consensus shows an area for possible unity um, on this issue as well. Yeah. Tim, let's talk about funding for a minute. Um, the poll found that 58 percent of Americans oppose or strongly oppose using tax dollars to pay for a woman's abortion. 77 percent of Americans oppose or strongly oppose using the tax dollars to support abortions in other countries. Uh, so, Tim, what's the takeaway there for lawmakers who are really pushing policies to the contrary? Well, again, here's another great uh, consistent result that we've seen. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, when most Americans are asked if they're pro-life or pro-choice, we don't get uh, a very good answer. I mean, even in our own poll over a decade, the number has gone back and forth and, and changed quite a bit. But when we're asking these more nuanced questions, we see that 
Uh, Americans have this this pro-life bend in them. They don't. The long tradition we've had since the 70s, the 70s of not, of having the Hyde Amendment uh, and not using taxpayer or funding domestically, and of course the Mexico City policy, which blocks funding internationally, which was uh, rescinded this week, uh, unfortunately. And so I think the, like I said, I think the area for unity in this divisive issue of abortion is is here in the, here in these areas that we found in the poll. And and I really hope that policymakers do see this and and do take action. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, events like today's March for Life certainly make clear the overwhelming support, too, that exists here in the U.S. for building a culture of life. We know that. How important is that that we continue to do that? I think it's I think it's vital, and I was very lucky to be one of the few people who marched today uh, in the in the scaled back March for Life. And I can tell you that the spirit is very much alive uh, in the pro life movement and in that group that was down there today at the mall and going over to the Supreme Court. Uh, it may have just been a small group, but I think we represent, I know we represent tens of millions, and the polling shows we represent maybe maybe even more than that. Um, and so I think uh, events like the march, events that we see in the states and the state marches that the that are that are happening more and more and even in our local communities are vital to send the signal that these um, that these areas do have areas of, of unity and consensus and that they can be seen uh, when folks are are peacefully demonstrating on it. Tim, um, as we know, the march took on a, a different look this year. You mentioned you were there. Uh, if you don't mind, quickly give us your thoughts um, on the atmosphere there today. Well, the, it was uh, everyone is still very uh, optimistic and wants to work to advance a culture of life. You know, uh, Jeannie Mancini, the head of the March for Life, uh, started us out before we uh, we started marching, and she you know reminded us of, of everything we need to do with the hope that next year. Uh, we'll be back to having you know tens and hundreds of thousands of marching with us, and and have a much more uh, joyful and boisterous atmosphere that we usually have. Today was a little bit more somber. Uh, people were using the opportunity to pray uh, and to reflect, especially as we you know went through a city that is um, you know it needs to be is, is going through a lot more security. We marched around the fence lines, um, but I will also say that the, the police were out and they were incredibly uh, helpful um, and and really collaborative. And, good to collaborate with and, and really make sure everyone felt safe and could march. So I think it was a really good day for life. Yeah, absolutely. Tim, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for being with us. Tim Sakosha, Senior Policy Director for the Knights of Columbus. Thanks again. Thank you. Up next, organizers of the 2023 World Youth Day in Lisbon released their theme song and logo. Charities of the Diocese of Arlington reports a dramatic increase in the number of new families seeking to adopt as 20 new families have begun the adoption process in just the last six months. Joining me now on Skype is Megan Lane, Program Director, Pregnancy and Adoption Support with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington. Megan, welcome back. So great to speak with you again. That is such wonderful news. Um, how many children have you been able to place or assist in placing over the past year? Well, actually, in the past year, our agency has provided direct services and supports to over 100 adoptions, um, and that's in many different contexts, not just placements. And in the past six months, ever since um, the beginning of the pandemic, we've definitely seen an increase in the number of families that are discerning that call to adopt, and we've almost doubled or over doubled the number of families who are now um, interested in adopting. That is so incredible. And of course, you know, we're not talking numbers here really. Uh, talk a, a little bit about the difference that this is really making in the lives of the children and families and the broader community that you serve. Well, there, there's such a need for a diverse um, pool of families to be open to adoption. Our program works with a number of different types of adoption, but especially, you know, it being um, the day of the March for Life, I just wanted to talk a little bit about families who open their hearts and their homes to vulnerable children in foster care. Uh, this is absolutely a need that exists with over 100,000 children in the United States who are available for adoption today. And so when families take time to um, pray about the call to adoption and go in this next direction, it really helps us to be able to support those children who are in need of forever families. Yeah, Megan, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Uh, also tell us specifically, what kind of support does Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington, what does it provide? 
Well, we believe that adoption is a lifelong journey. It starts when you fill out that application, uh, but it doesn't end. It's Adoption is interwoven into your identity as a family. And so we believe in providing a lifelong um, access to resources and support. So we serve uh, birth parents and adoptive families and adoptees um, who throughout their life. We've been doing adoption since 1947, so um, we were there through every step of that journey with our clients. I'm curious, how great is the need nationally, and how many children are waiting for families? Well, there's a great need um, nationally, like I said, for a foster care adoption. There are over 700,000 children in the U.S. foster care system and 100,000 available for adoption. So these children, they're all going to have, um, you know, a trauma history. Being in foster care is very traumatic. So we need families to be open to learning about how to meet their needs and to promote healing. Um, and families also, especially who are open to having siblings placed together or older children who are in foster care. There's the need is very great. And if somebody's watching and they're really feeling called to do this, where can people go to find out more? Um, well, I'm always happy to be a resource. I think we have our website um, that you can access at ccda.net. And so you can always reach out to me or also just your local foster care resources in whatever state that you live in. Okay, Megan, thank you so much. Megan Lane, Program Director, Pregnancy and Adoption Support with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Arlington. Thank you. thank you, and thank you for what you do. Thank you. And finally tonight, Portugal is preparing for the World Youth Day International event that was established by St. John Paul II. The event will take place in Lisbon in August 2023. EWTN Newsroom correspondent Colin Flynn gives us an update on the ongoing preparations. Good evening, Tracy. Well, this week, the official theme song for World Youth Day in Lisbon was released with the title, There's a Rush in the Air. Now, the song is based on the theme of World Youth Day, which is Mary rose up and went with haste. The song and the theme, they recall the story of when Our Lady said yes to the angel Gabriel to give birth to the Son of God. The song was written by Father João Paul Vaz, a 51-year-old priest from the city of Pombal, which is around 30 minutes north of Fatima. And the music, was composed by Pedro Ferreira, a teacher and a musician from a Portuguese band. Now these two, the writer and the composer, were chosen from over a hundred applicants to create the official song for World Youth Day. Another important symbol of World Youth Day, Tracy, is the logo, which this year was designed by a young graphic designer from Lisbon named Beatriz Royke Antunes. Central to the logo is the Christian cross with the colors of the Portuguese flag. The design also shows a path that goes through the cross, signifying Mary's visit to her cousin Elizabeth. And from that path, Mary's face also appears, along with rosary beads, showing Portugal's devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. World Youth Day will take place in August of 2023. Of course, the event was originally scheduled for 2022, but due to the pandemic, the Vatican decided to postpone the event to a safer date. In Rome, Colm Flynn, EWTN News Nightly. Hey, Colin, thank you so much for that report. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.